Hi, I'm Lisa Entwistle, founder of Wealthy Living and host of Wealthy Living Radio Show. Through conversations with my guests, my intention is to help you, the listener, to live a life where you have the knowledge, confidence and clarity to make choices that support your well-being, both personally and professionally. So today's topic is about menstruation or periods, and it's something that every single healthy woman experiences. Yet talking about periods has often been a taboo subject. Most girls even shy away from using the word period and instead use phases, phrases such as time of the month or on the rags. Now there's no denying that period stigma still exists that both girls and women carry shame around their monthly bleeding time. Thankfully, this is slowly changing, and we've even seen a period emoji, which has just been launched, which now does show something about the changing times. But the real truth is that we still have a really long way to go to combat the shame and the silence that many girls and women feel around their period. Now, I believe that speaking about an issue, whether it be with friends, families, in schools, workplaces, or in public conversations like in this podcast, it's the only way to combat the silence and encourage more conversations that allow for innovative and creative solutions to take place. So it gives me so much pleasure to introduce my guest today, who is certainly on a mission to end the taboo of menstruation worldwide. Stasha Washburn, Washburn, Washburn mm-hmm. is, a known, is known as the period coach, a certified holistic health coach coupled with 20 years of research has fueled her passion to reconnect women to the power in their menstrual cycles. Stasha is changing the conversation around periods from whispers in the ladies' room to empowered public discussions. After spending 20 years searching for a way to relieve her endometriosis, in the process, she discovered how to help women balance their hormones through both science and some may refer to as woo. This ignited her vision of becoming a global speaker where she now uses her voice to bring insights and subsequent relief to the women worldwide. So welcome, Stasha. Hello, thank you for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure and it's such a good conversation to have and I think one that doesn't happen often enough. Like in your world, you might feel like it's happening all the time because they're the conversations that you're having over and over and in the public forum, on different podcasts and in magazines and on social media sites. But for most people generally, it's not a conversation that people are having, even with their family members. Yeah. You know, people are silent and private and secretive and God forbid you use, you know, tell anyone that you're having a period where you've got it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's really great to be able to have this conversation with you and take away some of the stigma around it. So when I think of some of the words that are used when describing the way that girls or women feel about their periods or how other people feel, like even men feel when they think of women and their periods, the words like shame come up, um, disgusting, dirty, like words that don't necessarily have such a positive connotation Um, when, you know, it's something that women are going through every single month, a healthy woman every single month and have been for centuries and centuries And it's not limited to Western countries. You know, it is countries all over the world and women all over the world. Yeah. Um, And it's needed. It's probably happening around you right now. That's right. (laughs) And it's needed to bring even men into the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. (laughs) Exactly. So how do you, you know, what what do you feel has led to this, you know, to these feelings and these Descript these words that are being used to describe periods. Yeah, well, once upon a time, it was really a, a respected, revered part of the community. Women often went to bleed together. It's, yep. it's very tied to the moon cycles. Um, so women often went to bleed together, and back in the red tent days, uh, they would come back with a mission, a, a vision, a statement, an idea, something for the community to go forth with the next month. 
In fact, that was part of the thing was to retreat and take these days while bleeding to get messages from the gods or whatever. And now we know that it's actually the time when the synopses between your left and your right hemisphere of your brain are actually firing the most. So you're very creative and very logic. So it's a really good, like, big vision and seeing the path forward time for women. Mm. So when a whole community got together of women that were in that sacred space, in that feeling of this is awesome, like let's really help our community, like let's come to the sacred moment and retreat and have ritual and bleed and and let the ideas of what to do come. It was a very different process than it is now where Mm. it's, you know, go isolate yourself Go be silent. Don't let anyone know. If somebody knows, that's the end of it. Um, Even in high school, when I uh, would get my period, I would often pass out. So it kind of just collapsed wherever I was. Mm. And then when I would come to, I remember the first time, maybe not the first time, but one of the first times that that happened um, actually it wasn't the first time cause it was, I, I, that happened a couple of times and I realized, Oh, when that happens, I go to the bathroom and then I have my period. So at one point somebody asked, you know, what, what's wrong with you? And I went, Oh, I, I just got my period. And they were like, Oh my God, TMI, that is super gross. It was the nineties. <laughs> and, uh, and that's when I realized that I had to lie. So here I am a teenager who's collapsing from the pain of getting like, just this went down like a ton of bricks. So I would just pass out. I'd wake up, I'd be in pain. I would be vomiting for three days from just how painful it was. And I still had to collect myself enough to lie if there was somebody around me and just be like, Oh, I must be really sick. I must have food poisoning. I must have the flu. Like I had to be prepared enough to come out of collapsing in public with a lie to help maintain the feelings of those around me. So this taboo is really like that big. So what happened, there's a lot of things that happened, but one of the biggest things that happened is the change in our religious culture that moved into a patriarchal, you know, one man religion cultures. Uh, and through that establishment, all of the feminine was had to be dismantled. It had to be destroyed in order for the man, that male-dominated religion to take hold. And you look at the history of Christianity and, you know, nothing against Christians or anything, but a lot of the Christian, like a lot of the religion, the, the Christmas is at that time, because that's what the pagan religion was doing. And the only way to get people to convert was to just overlay the ceremonies of Christianity over the pagan rituals and co-op them. Mm. Easter, Jesus rising from the dead, like the Easter bunny and eggs have nothing to do with that. But that's the time that pagan traditions had those symbols of fertility because it was a time of fertility ritual. So a lot of the the what we have now was co-opted from those times and and the female, the feminine, those kinds of things were turned and established as very negative. Mm. And it's really obvious when you look into the witch hunts, the trials, because as is described, there's a handbook, the Malleus Maleficarum, that was how to hunt and and judge a witch. And it really is talking about women who know herbs, who help other women through childbirth, who help other women have a healthy cycle, who help women with pain. So a lot of those women's mysteries, as we would call them, were actually grounds for torture Because it wasn't just like, oh, you're a witch, I'm going to burn you at the stake. There's actually a year-long torture process that Mm. happened. So, And it took 200 years. And it took an estimated 7 to 9 million deaths to really separate women from their cycles. Mm. And that's and then that's Western Europe, but like we colonized the rest of the world and attempted to take over a lot of other places. So we took those ideas to a lot of other cultures and took it with us around the world, which is terribly unfortunate, but that I think is one of the biggest reasons that we have those issues now. Uh, There's definitely other cultures in the world that have different pathways, but as far as like my own history as a white, like Eastern and Western European woman, that's where that history comes for us and for the Western world, for sure. 
The other taboos, especially in like India with that culture, it's a little bit different, but they also ended up in that same place yeah. with isolation and menstrual huts and, you know, can't go to temple at that time. You can't go to pray at that time. You yeah. can't be in a kitchen at that time. So it really came down through religions around the world. Um, so that's really, I think, the biggest factor in all of it. And now it's up to us to just change that conversation back mm. and turn it into one of positivity. Yeah, and I definitely, um, firstly, thank you for that history lesson. Kind of a long-winded history lesson. Sorry, (laughs) try to condense it as much as I can. No, (laughs) no, it's really really important, I think, in the conversation to really understand some of that history. And, I mean, you did condense it because there is a hell of a lot more history in that and there are, you know, so many cultures doing it so differently and you just said India for one. But a lot of of, um, third world countries um, don't, even though they have that, they may still have a lot more ritual than Western countries in a lot of ways. They still have a lot of exclusion when it comes to women and menstruating and they're excluded. And so they're seen as they're not clean or they're not um, Mm -hmm. kind of accepted to do the normal life while they're bleeding. And so that then how would someone generally feel in those circumstances if it's not championed but instead you're feeling completely excluded? So it is important to understand some of that history and how it came about as well. Now, you mentioned that, you know, at the end there that we, you know, need to start doing it differently and there's mm-hmm. no doubt about that and you're doing it differently and you're trying to on a mission to, to change that and that's brilliant and I definitely want to talk a lot about that. But before we do, let's just talk a little bit about, a little bit further in a little bit more depth about some of these negative impacts that the way that we are currently and have been doing it and I yeah. know it's slightly s- slowly changing. Mm-hmm but only in certain more conscious type communities so far, Um, the impact that that actually has and the ripple effect because the example that you gave in your personal experience is all around concealment. Right. So what is, you know, concealment is probably the biggest issue when it comes to, um, girls and women and menstruation and when we conceal something it's also telling ourselves that we're ashamed yeah of something so we're ashamed of ourselves what our body as a feminine natural cycle is doing we have a whole massive body shaming yeah female God. body shaming movement on its own business. which is a whole nother episode but you know there's all these things do you think that some of that body shaming like that is a ripple effect possibly coming from oh for some sure. things to do with you know bleeding as well i mean there it's it's a it's a money-making industry shame for women is a money-making industry yeah. so when you look at body shaming you would be putting billion dollar businesses out of business if you were to say, you're fine, you don't need a six step moisturizing routine every day that costs you hundreds of dollars a month. Like the the weight loss industry, the skincare industry, the makeup industry, the plastic surgery industry. I mean, a friend of mine went to go have um, a surgery for endometriosis and on the form it was like, here's all these plastic surgeries that you can have done Mm. as well. Are you interested in any of these? And to get her endo surgery, she had to go through like 20 different plastic surgeries, elective breast augmentation, anal bleaching. I mean, you name it. She was like, I don't even know what some of these are. And I was like, well, but you should have a complex about them. So go figure out what they are so you can feel badly about it now. So it's just, it's a huge industry. And it, and it makes a lot of people a lot of money. Well, it makes a lot of men a lot of money. So really, it, it's the same. And in, in the history of the menstrual cycle, when they are, well, in the industry here, and in, in, in any case, uh, they, they you can see the clear change of how it goes from women dealing with their cycles by just using rags or like household cloths, which... Sure, not the most sanitary nor the most effective, and we absolutely have much better reusable products like cups and panties and cloth pads with like bamboo cores and stuff now, but to using disposables, and the disposables, they they went through this process of going, okay, but to sell these, we have to sell them in a way that women are going to buy, 
And women wouldn't go in and ask for a sanitary pad. So Kotex actually branded the first uh, pads as you could ask for, just ask for a Kotex. So you didn't have to say mm. pad. And they invented the vending machine. They, they put little boxes in stores where you would put your money in for them and you could just take one. Mm. So it, it, they really structured it so that, that you didn't have, they, they kind of gave it that hush hush vibe about it. And to be fair, women also didn't want to have that conversation because that would, because men were the shopkeepers and they would have to go to a man Hmm. And say, I need to get this thing. So you see that happen, and then you see the progression of douches and scented things. And now all of a sudden, in I think it was the 50s, you started to see ads for, you need to smell like a flor- flower bed. You know what's wrong with your marriage? You don't smell like lavender. <laughs> so all of these, this is, I did a lot of this research for my book. Um, and I just went through all of these old ads and I, I've never been more angry in my life going through these old ads, but that you see the progression of how it gets more and more intense. And it's like, okay, we've tapped everything we can do on like scent. We got to go into this next thing. And you yeah. just see how they start going from one thing to the entire being of a woman. And how yeah. can we make every single thing about being a woman shameful? And mm. how can we make you want to conceal everything about you. Mm. It's a really, it was a very progressive, detailed, thought out system. It was Mm. very well done. I have got to give them credit for that. Yeah. And I think so well done that even a man of today who, let's just say of the older, an older Mm -hmm. generation, but still today, who would definitely be a lot more progressive than, you know, grandparents time. Um, would be so almost brainwashed by all of these ads Mm -hmm. and all these things that you see that they would probably not consider themselves someone who would be shaming women. But yet they would be, don't talk about periods. Right. Don't talk about, no, 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 that's hush, hush, that's all I want to know, bleeding, don't tell me, not my ears, not not public company. Mm -hmm. Exactly, conversation. So, it's funny because those pe- that is shaming. Yeah. But those people would not even see themselves no. as shaming. That's how well right. these campaigns have been done. It, yeah, very very well done. And it's funny like I can't tell you how many men just in my life, friends of friends, boyfriends of friends, men, but just how many men have come to me and just very quietly been like, "I've got some questions for you." Like they want to understand but it's not something that they can talk to. And frankly, women don't know. Yes. Like I, I have a, a couple of, of men that I have coached that have asked me questions like, you know, in their relationships, like that's not what we were talking. That wasn't the premise of the coaching. This is when I was business coaching. Um, but th- we'd end up on conversations with, you know, like, Oh my, you know, my girlfriend and I have been having the same argument over and over again. And we would just start to talk about it. And then knowing what I knew about the cycle and going, okay, well, here's what you need to do. And I think this will actually end the arguments. And it did Mm. (laughs) every time because women don't know. They don't know themselves. So a woman can't go and say, look, babe, this is just the thing. I like after I've ovulated, my testosterone and estrogen go down and that takes my confidence with me. And that's just, it's not because you're weaker or less than or not a confident, independent woman. It's just that as your hormones come down from this real confident place, you feel less confident than you did two days ago. So you turn to your partner for some kind of reassurance. He doesn't know what's going on. Mm. You don't know what's going on. You just know that all of a sudden you feel like, I need some reassurance over here. And you don't know why or what's happening. Mm. And everyone just suddenly is like, what is going on in our relationship? Yeah. When in reality, it's a really easy fix. Just know what's that, happening. That's great. And it's it's great that you say that because that's, in, you know, even I didn't know that know that fact. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that that's what happened afterward. But everybody does know about the, what happens before. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm premenstrual. Yeah. You know, don't come near me. You know, yeah. all of that. Because it's a little bit more obvious to maybe decipher and what's going on a little yeah. bit more. But it is really interesting. And I love that you say that because... Um, in all of my work, I'm really about core foundations, meaning that getting to know yourself first. Yes. 
Um, doesn't matter if you're if it's to do with their business, your business, yeah. your relationships, your health, but really coming back to self and self awareness. Mm-hmm. And it is easy to um, to outsource to try to outsource the responsibility on somebody else mm-hmm. and then blame. Yeah. But um, and and I think it is important in this situation that men get educated too. But it is that you. A woman can't ask a man or anybody else to get educated right. if they don't really know about themselves. Yeah. So ultimately, that is the first step, that self-awareness right. and the education. And I know that in schools today, it's certainly a lot more broad and a lot more open and, and better than it used to be Um well, I don't even remember it being <laughs> educated <laughs> at school about periods, but I know now that they do have... Some um, of them are better, yeah. Yeah, some, some of them, them are better. Not. Yeah, and... Um, <laughs> I know my daughter goes to a girls' school, so I know that maybe I um, theirs might be a little bit more in detail mm-hmm. because it is just girls. Yeah. Um, and then and then girls aren't, I suppose, in a co-ed school. They're made to like separate for the education, and then which it, I really think does yeah. a disservice to everybody. That's right. And and the fact is, you know, there's generalities. Like, but even with my clients, my membership um, girls, my period coaching school girls. We talk about finding your snowflake moment where this is the general gist of what happens in a menstrual cycle. And most women feel like this, but there is going to be something Mm. in there that you're a little different. And I don't know what it is for you. And this is why we chart. And this is why we track. And we do pay attention to these things. Because every woman is going to have this one thing that's just a little bit her unique individual twist. Yeah. And... It does a huge disservice to us to, A, not have the foundational education because when you know what generally is going on, then you can know where you are in that alignment and where you might have something that's a little bit different. And it might mean there's a hormonal imbalance. Yep. It might mean there's an unresolved trauma. It might mean that that's just your unique little snowflake moment. (laughs) And that's okay too. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, totally. And it is embra- about embracing that and embracing your differences yeah. and being confident enough to go that um, that that's okay. But it's it's I suppose again comes back to that knowledge. If mm-hmm. we have knowledge yeah. that there is an individual snowflake moment for everybody, then we don't feel mm-hmm. different, and then the shame of yeah the uniqueness doesn't exist exactly. So, yeah, definitely so much comes down to education, which is why you're yeah. doing such a good job in all that you do and all the education that you give around cycles mm-hmm. and um, and how they relate to different aspects in their life, everybody's life, and as well as the charting, which I want to get into um, soon. But before we do move again to mm-hmm. that positive stuff, if we can just look at some of these more, just a little bit yeah. more of these ripple effects, because I think it's really important that people um, are really aware of yes. the damage, Yes, you know, because it's very easy 100%. to say, who cares? It doesn't matter. So what if I want to talk secretly about it? What's the big deal? But I think that people haven't gone enough have enough um maybe enough thought or insights into into what the damage is because this concealment causes lying and then you know you just mentioned before this whole idea when you were giving your example Mm -hmm. about you concealed it because you were managing someone else's emotions and when you said that I thought wow yeah you know how many clients I have today in lifestyle coaching that come problems come from managing yep. other people's emotions and this yep. has nothing to do with periods. Oh, yeah. Um, and I know that I do it as well. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I mean, I'm, you can't put it all down to doing that from when they were young and getting their periods, but everything we do and all of our yeah. experience in life adds to ways that become patterns. Yes. And, you well, know. Women are culturally conditioned to manage everyone else's emotions. emotions. And we live in a rape culture. So if you offend a man it's a you could potentially be physically harmed. sexually mm. harmed verbally harmed is like a day it's just, that's just a day is in a life of a woman you know cat calls and verbal abuse and those kind yeah. of oh all right sweetheart sure no worries honey okay sweet cheeks like that's just a daily occurrence in the life of a woman um but we know that if we say no to that guy for that date, that he might stalk us. He might threaten us. He might actually physically harm us. And I don't personally know very many women. I, I've talked about this a lot on my Facebook page, and I've had one woman 
over the years of doing this say nothing like that has ever had happened to me. One out of hundreds and the thousands in my Facebook group and the thousands that I've talked to and coached and worked with and whatnot, one woman has said, I've never been physically or sexually assaulted. And I was like, you're my, I just, woo, we got one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to like hug her and be like, oh my God, tell us how you did it. Um, so we are culturally conditioned that we have to manage other people's mm. emotions for th- physical or sexual threat yeah. is as the punishment. So. But even so, you know, this one isn't necessarily like in your instance, isn't even necessarily right, just related to men. It's it related just, to, you to, just take that on. Right. So it's moms have to manage their kids' emotions. Yes. Kids have to manage their parents' emotions. Yeah. At girls, you see daughters managing their brother's emotions. You see daughters managing mom and dad's emotions. Yeah. You see, it happens in every aspect of life for women. Women secretaries managing their bosses' emotions. It's yeah. just constantly happening. And in high school, you're always trying to manage other people's emotions because it's such a vulnerable time. Yeah. It's very, you know, I mean, I have a unique experience. I, I moved a lot. I didn't really have friends, like a group of friends that like I had grown up with or anything in high school. So for me, it was like constantly trying to manage other people's emotions just to like get through the day without having like some crazy fight with some person I didn't even know, but yep. um, yeah, you're just always doing that as a woman. And that's part of the conversation starting, like having these conversations around cycles helps you feel so much more confident. Yeah. You start to say, you know what? No, I'm done managing somebody else's emotions around this thing. It happens to 52% of the population for 40 years. Most women are menstruating. If you're, if you shake hands with five women a day, one of those women probably was changing a tampon that day. Like you just have to deal with the fact that somebody's probably menstruating around you all of the time mm. and we need to stop hiding it. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm just going to free bleed in the office all day. But like, it doesn't have to be a like, ah, can you pass me a tampon? Like yeah. you, it doesn't have to be an absolute dead secret either. Mm. And as you start to say like, even in your just a group of friends saying like, mm, you know what? I think I'm going to have my period that day. Can I get back to you closer to RSVP? Or you know what? That's going to be right around my bleed and I'm just going to be really tired and I definitely am not going to want to go out. Or you know what? I'm going to be ovulating. Who wants to go dancing tonight? Yeah. Like if you can start having those conversations, you start putting out boundaries that say, I don't need to manage your emotions anymore. Yeah. I'm just going to deal with what I need and, and my friends and we'll all be cool and we'll get it and we'll be chill together. And then it'll spread. And the other thing that comes from this conversation is being like, okay, well, I don't want to talk about it. There's no reason for that. I don't need to is a privileged attitude. Mm. You have privilege to be silent But there are women who are dying, who are being raped because they're menstruating. It's there's cultures that that is a thing. Um, The AIDS epidemic in Africa, there was this theory that if you had sex with a menstruating girl, not even an adult girl, like young girl, that you could cure AIDS, HIV. Uh, It led, there's a lot of sex trade that happens because they know that girls don't go to school when they're menstruating. So they're often home alone. So it's a great time to go grab a girl Mm -hmm. to get her into human trafficking. Like it's very dangerous for women in lots of different parts of the world, even in the United States where I live. Mm -hmm. So being like, oh, I just don't want to talk about it. It's, you know, I don't have to. That's a, that's a place of privilege that you're having that Mm -hmm. conversation. And it's, not usually the poor women that are having that conversation because it's usually the upper class mm. white women having that conversation. And it is a, it is a, it's certainly not something that we're going to perfect in my lifetime. It's certainly mm. not something I'm going to perfect in my lifetime. It's something that we're all going to have to just work on and work towards, but it's definitely one of those things where you, you're just going to have to get a little bit uncomfortable and have mm. those conversations because to stay silent is privilege mm. and we need to make those changes. Women luxury taxes on products, uh, not having them supplied for women who are lower income, who mm. have to choose between a, 
a pad or food or yeah, those terrible. kinds of choices. Women in jail have to pay for their products. They don't, they're in jail. How are they going to pay for those products? Like yeah. there's just so many places mm-hmm. where it's not a privilege. It's not something you can just not talk about. You have to have these conversations. If we don't have them, these women continue to suffer. And it's not just, Oh, well just stay home and bleed at home where you're mm-hmm. not making a mess. It's, you yeah, know, human trafficking and sex slave right. and rape. And that's that's where it's like women die. I mean, there was a death not too long ago in India of a woman who was put into a shack for her bleed and died of exposure. Like or one was died from a snake bite. Like it's women die because of this and yeah. because of the silence. And it's that's got to stop. Yeah. And I mean even even just on a not um like, you know, third world country far Mm -hmm. out level, like even just in a Western country, you've, I was reading an article whereby um, it was about a woman that was homeless Mm -hmm. and she was on the street and just, you know, asking for money. And like, I think I do a lot of the time when um, outside the supermarket, when people ask for money, I'll tend to want to give them food Mm -hmm. instead of giving them money. But this article was really interesting because it was saying it was a woman and she didn't want, they were just, someone was just giving me food, but she didn't want food. She wanted money because she needed to go and buy tampons. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it was, mm-hmm. it's just something a lot of people do not think about, which is why I really wanted to have this conversation because these are just, it's just yeah. awareness. And oh, it's yeah. not that anybody's intentionally, a lot of people aren't intentionally trying to do the wrong no. thing. They just don't mm-hmm. think of it. Right. Because we don't have these conversations. Sessions. And, and like I said, the, those, those negatives, the death, the the sex slavery, those kinds of things, they happen in the United States. It's not a third world country that that's the only place that happens. Yeah. It happens in the United States. Yeah. It's, it's something that's probably happening in your own backyard. Mm. I mean, I, no matter, it happens in London. There's a, there's a huge movement mm. in England, in Ireland for menstrual health and awareness as well. And they're really kicking ass and taking names in the UK. Like I got to give them credit for that. The women out there are really Mm. moving some things forward, but that happens and that happens in first world countries around the world. So it is happening in your backyard, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And I think with this whole um, massive movement into female leadership Mm -hmm. and into, which will obviously change a lot of things going down the track. But um, even with this whole idea of women, becoming more educated and women becoming in more more leadership positions this whole concealment stuff and girls especially in in these developing countries having to miss school mm-hmm. is almost just setting them up for for almost failure in that area because how are they to reach their full potential yep. When they can't even go to school. Also happens in the United States. Yeah. When they can't go to school Mm -hmm. because of their periods. And I'm not talking about like, you know, your child has a day they've got cramps and you let them stay home and you Mm honour themselves. That's different. But, you know, actually missing because it's it's too much shame and too much No, they have to drop out because they get so far behind. They miss a week, five days, five to seven days a month, every month they fall behind and they ultimately don't graduate. And that happens again in first world countries, just as it does in third world countries. And uh, one of the um, non-for-profits that I, I, my summit, which I've done the last two years, uh, we donate part of our profits to days for girls because that's part of their mission is to get girls those days in school days for girls. Um, And actually that was one of, they were one of the ones that educated me about just how, the lives lost and all of that, um, the rape and the, and the sexual slavery and that kind of thing that happens because that's what they were starting to see. But they have chapters in first world cult, cult, uh, countries because it happens there too. Mm. And ultimately these girls aren't graduating and they're not getting an education. And we're, we're in a place in our culture, in our world where we need Every brain that can think of how to get us out of this climate crisis, out of these economic, just disparaging, just collapsing around us, all of these things that are equal rights, all the you know, human rights, all of these things are happening. Water, what, 
We're going to be running out of water. Like all of these things are happening in our world. And over the next hundred, couple hundred years, we're going to see massive changes. And if we don't have every freaking available bit of brilliant brain working on the problems, we're screwing ourselves. And we're okay with screwing ourselves just because we can't have a conversation about periods so yeah. that these poor girls can get an education so maybe some of them can grow up and be world leaders and change our future? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Really? I just don't believe that the taboo has that much power. I really, truly believe yeah. enough women have enough bravery to have these conversations so we can get everyone through school and everyone educated so that we can actually make some changes in the world. Mm. Uh, I agree. Yeah, it's massive, and you know, it does. It does seem when you put it like that, it just seems, it just seems really crazy, doesn't it? Sometimes you just have to make it really simple. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we were all taught. You know, these girls and women are taught to be private, yet they yeah. we have to continue our lives as normal, and mm-hmm. the systems aren't set up for the changes that go on right. and the changes that we, you know, go through in a four week cycle. Mm-hmm. And um, and as you said, there's different different parts of the cycle. Yeah. Um, are different for every person and we are also in a it's not like everybody's going through them at the same time the same cycle so we can't just set up a whole system based on it because everybody's got a different week at a different time and so it can become quite complicated which then comes down to just honoring each individual right but that's easier said than done for especially for a corporation that wants to make money yep absolutely and so that leads, I think, you know, the ripple effect to that is a whole lot of women and a whole lot of girls being really anxious and really stressed um, because they're scared of possibly, you know, not feeling well, mm-hmm. having to make an excuse and pretend that they don't have their period because they don't want to be seen lesser than men yeah. in the same place yeah. or as a little girl she doesn't want to maybe – the thought of, oh, my God, what if I leak and I've got yeah. sport and I've got – like there's so yeah. many things around mm-hmm. leading a normal lifestyle. I also don't want to – God forbid I, want, I don't want to be labelled a victim because right. just like, you know, a mother or a person who's going through childbirth that's getting anxious about that will have someone go, oh, millions of women have been through that. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's the same with periods. Don't complain about that every – 52% yeah. of the population go through it. You're not, not unique. Yep. You know, so there's this shame of feeling mm-hmm. how you feel. Mm-hmm. There's a shame with even saying that that's how you feel. And so it's not so easy to just change it. No, it's not. So I want to, I mean, from this conversation so far, I think that anyone listening would gather that um, there is a need for change. And that's quite obvious. Mm -hmm. But the hard part is, is how do we do that, especially in a society that runs a certain way? Yeah. Well, we are changing society. Yeah. That's probably one of the biggest impacts that just having these conversations has. Yeah. And I have talked to businesses and corporations and larger scale corporations about looking at their productivity in different ways. Yep. And I've seen a lot of men sit at those tables and say, that makes sense. Okay, let's see what we can do. Yep. And it's not looking at these minute, detailed, like daily product report things that a lot of corporations put into place because that's how men work. Men work on that 24-hour androgen cycle. And it's looking, it's, it's looking at how much does that woman get done in, say, a month? Because if you looked at most women's productivity, they get an amazing amount of work done in the first half of their cycle and then less in the second half of their cycle. And so we spend that second half of our cycle beating ourselves up because we're not getting all of the stuff done that we think we're supposed to be getting done or like, Oh, but I did a 16 hour work day yesterday and I was a rock star and now I feel like I need a nap. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? When in reality, there's nothing wrong with you. You just went through your ovulation phase and now you've had a dip in your hormones and now you're just a little, you need a little more rest. You need a little bit more time. But the fact is you got a 40 hour work week done in three days. So now you can chill and rest and relax. Corporations aren't set up that way though. Yeah. So this is where 
turning that how we look at things. And corporations get it. They talk about quarterly profits and projected things. They understand bigger pictures than just the minute things. But it has to get into the management, the middle management, those in-between levels, mm-hmm. because they're the ones managing the actual people. Yeah. So the upper, the, I see it makes sense to the CEOs and the C boards of corporations. Like they get it, but they have to be able to communicate that to the management across the board. And this is where you really get into more systems management, system thinking, these kinds of processes. But it is done. It's do. It's happening. It's yeah. changing. I I see it happening. I see corporations going. Look, if it if taking three days and working at home means you get everything that you need to get done, but you get it done at home and you don't have cramps because you're in bed with a hot water bottle, then screw it. Go do it at yeah. home. And you're starting to see that happen more and more where it's like you're still accountable. You still have to get the stuff done. But your phone can be forwarded to your cell phone. Yeah. And you can still get the same things done in a laptop in bed that you can mm. going to work. So you're we're seeing some of those changes and... To be honest, some of them aren't going to work. Some of them will, though. Yeah. But there's no harm in trying. So it's about more self-responsibility and autonomy and trust in someone else. So it gives brings back a bit more of that human element yeah. rather than such a hierarchical um, control, well, there is, controlling leadership. Yes. there And there is also trust but, but verify that saying is legitimately like, look, if you say, okay, so for the next three months, let's try this where – you know, some women don't have any need to stay home and they're perfectly fine yeah. and they can go to work and they're great. And that's fantastic. And well done, sister. But like most women need a little more sleep. That's actually a normal thing. They need more sleep during that two week period. So why not give it a shot? See how it goes for a couple of months. If the same amount of work is getting done and I pose to you probably more gets done mm. then great. Success. I mean, my father managed an office for Social Security in New York State. He managed a whole region. And he was one of the first people to adopt homework for some of the women that had children with special needs and for some of the people who had their own medical problems happening. And he started saying, great, work from home. And mm-hmm. they got more done. Yeah. It was like, I, it worked like a dream. There was only one time where somebody took advantage of it. And this is the person who would have taken advantage of it in the office anyway. Yeah. So we tried something else because it, it, it was being taken advantage of in the office. We tried doing the home thing that also didn't work out well. It was just that person. Yeah. But across the board, it worked out really well. So, like, you know, if people in government can see this and see the potential benefits of it, then I know a corporation based off of money can go, oh, well, this will keep me making the same amount of money and my my employees will be happier, healthier, mm-hmm. less health insurance costs for our business. Then at the end of the day, that raises the bottom line too. Yeah. So can you just take everybody who's listening through um, just briefly, because I am aware of time, but just – the the cycle so yeah so just um looking at the different parts of the cycle and what are the main without going into too much mm-hmm. detail because i know that we can give someone a resource <laughs> we can, i'm sure you've got a resource somewhere on your website where you've where you've detailed this mm-hmm. a little bit more and we can put that in the show notes but what are the four cycles that people go through is there four yeah i uh there's four traditionally accepted phases your period your menstrual phase that's the easy one uh, five to seven days. So that's when you're bleeding. That's your bleeding. Uh, it should be healthy, bright red, should be pain free, bloating free, cramping free, should just be a good, maybe a little extra rust, but shouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, and then you go into your follicular phase. But can we, before we go into yeah. that, let's talk mm-hmm. about with oh, that yeah, phase. Sure. Mm-hmm. So with that phase, what sort of attributes do people want to look at mainly when they're thinking about that phase? So yeah. where are you most useful? Where can you yeah. be taken most advantage of in what areas? Yeah. And where do you possibly need to back off in that phase? Yeah. So it's your most introverted phase of the cycle. So often more women generally feel like the hustle and bustle is too much and can feel easily overwhelmed in that space, especially if they're forced to be out where there's a lot of noise and lights and craziness happening. They can feel very just, that's usually where I see a lot of my clients and myself get into that like kind of painful cycle or migraines, headaches, bloating, 
digestive process because it, it's stressing your system and that hits your digestion pretty hard. So it's a really good time to be looking at bigger picture things, taking some more time for yourself, just, you know, lock the bathroom door with you and the chocolate on the inside if that's what you need to do. <laughs> but, you know, taking some of that time. Um, I know a lot of the moms that I've worked with have taught their kids that when mommy's bleeding, she needs some extra help and attention. And her ki- and, and the kids, by and large, actually are like, oh, it's our turn to take care of mom. Like, they, they're generally, you know, they're good kids and they want to be helpful. And, and what about if, it, what if it's a teen child and they're going through that phase? Yeah, giving them that permission to rest, to nap, to relax, since they know to the pressures of being a teenager. And they're in, they're in school and got extracurricular. Yeah. Like, and sometimes they... that happens. And that's where, like, even I would have to come home from school, take a nap between school and the next event or. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times my parents would just let me come home from school early and take a nap, skip the last period, come home and rest before I had, I was in a dance company in high school. So I usually went straight from school to company classes. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of times where even like lunch break, I would come home and take a nap or go to the nurse's office and take a nap or just relax. And yeah. I, you know, or find a, an office. Like I had a great teacher in high school to let me just use her office as like a place to just go rest for lunchtime. And I would just bring my lunch and just go rest. I had a, I actually had a male teacher in high school who, God bless Mr. Odom, let me eat lunch (laughs) in his classroom all the time. And then when I had my period, I could actually just lay down in the corner and relax during that time. And he was perfectly fine with it. Like there's a lot of dif- different ways mm. that you can answer and find a solution. And it's and that's the thing is, fine, if it's not a problem, then that's not a problem. Yep. But if you need that little extra space and you want to maintain your commitments, there's ways that you can mm. do that. And one of the things you said right in the beginning of our conversation is when you talked about how in the past women went to the red tent at that phase mm-hmm. and it was the time when the right and the left part of the brain were both mm-hmm. really able to be active. So mm-hmm. a lot of great visions yeah, and that's why creative you do that power big picture came. stuff. So in knowing that, yeah. what if you owned a business and yeah. you're an entrepreneur or you worked, you know, yeah. even if you work for a company, what sort of work mm-hmm. is the best work to be Um, prioritizing in that phase. Yeah. So for the girls in your business or flow, that's just my membership program for entrepreneurial women. um, We talk about how that's your why phase. So, and so every month just taking time to make sure that your business vision, your life vision, all of these things are in alignment. So, you know, what do you want your life to look like? What is the purpose of your being on the planet? What do you want your retirement to look like? What is that really big picture? Mm. And is your business getting you there? Is it in alignment with what you, what's the difference you want to make on the planet? Is your business in alignment with making that happen? Doesn't mean that your business has to be actively doing that. It could be you're making the money so that you can do charity work or whatever. Like there can be different answers to that, but are, is your business in alignment with your greater So would you say that that phase then becomes like the reflective phase? Yeah, very much so. And it becomes, but it's not just reflection because it's also going, okay, so if, if it's not out of alignment, what needs to be fixed? You know, it's also a great time for those bigger things. Like for a lot of people doing online businesses, this is a great time to brainstorm an opt-in, a new freebie, a new gift for your people, a new, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be new, but it can also be going like, oh, you know what? We could tweak this and make it even better. Okay. So it's really igniting your creative juices. Yes. You're really, you are just so tuned in, tapped in, turned on during this time that if yeah. you give yourself that space. It yeah. works like a dream. Which, which ultimately really does make sense because what you're bleeding is the um, uteral lining, which is, or, which is basically the creation. Yeah. It's, 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 it's bleeding yeah. because it was supposed to be for the creation of another human. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so obviously and it has a lot of creative force mm-hmm. within it. Yeah, and it's a good time because when you go through that process, you realize what things aren't serving you anymore and you release. Yes. You let go. Whoa. So you go through and you're look like. And you flow. <laughs> right. Literally. So if you're looking at, okay, well, this is the vision. This is what I want in my life. And my business is in this alignment. And you go, okay, well, here's a fantastic opt-in. 
this is not in alignment. I need to stop doing this or I need to let this thing go or I need to let this product go. I need to let the service go. So it's just a really fantastic time. And I have my girls do this every single month in their period. And there's no better way to, you don't waste your time because you're on it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if we move from that to the next phase, what's the next phase? Follicular. It's when your the follicle in one of your ovaries is ripening an egg. It's the springtime. Your energy is more up. And it's So this is just post the period. Just post period. And it's a really good time to just do the work. You're far more how, like you can answer the how questions. So we just had why. Now we have how. Um, and you just, you know, it's a good time to put together that email system. It's a good time to create the opt-in path. It's a good time to just do that, like, back-end data tech work. You're just, you're far more patient. You are you can really problem-solve a lot better. And it's a great question to say, like, how can I make this better? How can I approach the situation better? Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, so then after that phase, so that takes you pretty much, you've got two weeks gone now. Yeah. So, the so now you're in ovulation. Mm-hmm. It's three to four days for every woman, no matter what, because that's just how long an egg is viable. So three to four days, no matter who you are. And uh, it's your due phase. This is when women really feel like they're at the peak. This is the most extroverted. It's the summer phase. It's definitely the most peak of everything. Your face is the most symmetrical. You're giving off the uh, give me whatever I want pheromones. Your body is like you're a fertile goddess and everybody just wants to give you what you want. So go ask for the raise. Go do the things. Have the hard conversations. Your verbal skills are peaking. Like everything is on this high phase and it's great. And it's only three to four days, and that's fine because you can knock out a 16-hour day on those days, no problem. And then go dance with the girls after. (laughs) Yeah, brilliant. So they're the times that are probably really good to schedule meetings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do a lot of my interviews during that time. I schedule all of my summit interviews during that time. I do a lot of... My video recording, batching my videos for my YouTube channel. I batch them all late follicular ovulation phase. Um, Yeah, it's just editing copy, going into your sales page, and just getting into the nitty-gritty of your sales page. It's all really good timing for that. Brilliant. And then the final phase? This is your little phase. And so... When we're lunar, when we're crazy, lunatics. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, And... And I, even in my book, I talked about this. I've broken it into two phases. And in Chinese medicine, they break it into two phases. Yep. They do the late summer and the autumn or fall. Uh, because there's two hormonal things, that shifts that happen during that phase. So it's 7 to 14 days, a week or two. And at that point, post-ovulation, your hormones crash. And a lot of women will feel like, oh, my God, what is wrong with me at that moment? And then they kind of get a second wind. Your estrogen rises again. And then it goes down again before menstruation. So we tend to get this like second wind mid uh, phase in the little phase. And that's where I break it up. So ovulation to the second wind and then post second wind until your period. Um, And that's those two phases. And that's just really, we are very visually and spatially aware. Most women find that this is when they realize their whole house needs to be remodeled. Their website (laughs) needs to be overhauled. They need to paint. They want to redo the cupboards. They need to do all the laundry. Oh my God, it sounds like me. (laughs) Well, because your body's going, oh, we might be pregnant. We should probably get this shit together so we can have a baby in here. So you go into kind of this nesting phase and it happens and uh, for my entrepreneurs, just not overhauling your website is basically where we start. Like just don't change everything. Like let's just get through to the bleed and then we'll talk about it. Um, And I call that the entrepreneurial version of PMS is I need to change everything in my business. I'm not even doing the right thing. I have to have a new target market. Like Uh, I am. You don't actually want to be someone who lives with me, including the kids, (laughs) um, at that time because I lose it when things are not in their place. Like, you know, and it's not like I'm an anal person by any stretch with everything being completely tidy all the time. Yeah. But at that time, it's like, Anything that could have slightly been moved around and tidied through the month yep. that wasn't done, anybody who didn't do it through the month yeah. will get hammered yeah. for not doing it 
yeah. at that phase. Yeah. Everything's so messy. Come on. Can, you know, like yeah. just, yeah, like that's a lunatic. Super, that's super normal. And here's the best. This is my favorite part of the cycle is right before your period, your testosterone has leveled out to what it is except for right before ovulation. It's flat line except for right before ovulation. So it's flat. But just before your bleed, your estrogen and your progesterone come down. And this is why actually a lot of women get a little spike in libido just yeah. before or like the first day of their period. Because actually their testosterone is often the highest uh, hormone in their body at that time. And so every time someone says, oh, what are you, menstrual? I just like to say... Well, actually, this is the time of the month when my hormones are most like a man. So this is what it's like to live with you 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days. <laughs> and then I usually end of that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that brings you back to your bleed. Yeah, brilliant. That's so good. And you know what? We could actually talk for another hour, mm -hmm. but we won't this time <laughs> because I'm aware that um, I do like to keep the episodes at you know, ideally around 45 minutes, but not longer than the hour. And we're about we're 55 <laughs> now. But I do know that you do have um, mm -hmm. a lot of information on diet and yeah. different foods that are really good at different phases to really help with, you know, the moods swings mm -hmm. to really help with the pains yeah. and the cramps and all those things that a lot of people do complain of when they bleed. Yep. And, um, and like you did say at one point in this conversation, and I know that you've you've gone through those phases as a teenager where you really struggled with it and now you don't struggle with it so much. So, um, you know, you've learned how many yeah. things that actually can be done and this responsibility that, can, that you yes. can actually put into place, the self-responsibility to reduce the risk or yeah. even eliminate some of these um, symptoms that a lot of women complain yeah. about. Yeah, unless you're really, really extreme, and I was really, really extreme, it's absolutely fixable, and I was fixable. Western medicine couldn't do anything. Yeah. But we're all, there's nothing wrong with us. We're just we, – we don't have a birth control deficiency. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Birth control is the answer for everything. Nobody has a birth control deficiency. So yeah. there is a solution. It's not that. Yeah, and that so. that's a whole other conversation, yeah. and we didn't get into it today, but I do yeah. know – I know myself that I went on birth control to stop the extreme cramping that I was going to get – during my yeah. year 12 exams and yeah. then ended up just staying on it for like 10 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. um, and, you yeah. know, and I know you speak to, I'm sure three out of five women will tell you they've done the same thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, that's maybe yeah. all the doctors were hard, the medical Western doctors, that's, that's all, all they, they knew. Yeah. So, you know, it's no one's fault, but no. that's just um, the situation. And there are lots yeah. of other options. And so yeah. if you are listening today and you're looking for other options, get in touch with Stasha. Yeah, heaps of resources, heaps yeah. of information, and there is so much more also readily available on the web these days than there used to be. Yeah. But again, it's sometimes hard to decipher which ones are backed by yeah. companies and yeah. which ones aren't. So it yeah. is really handy to get in touch with someone like Stasha who is a period yeah. coach. Yeah, definitely hit up the periodcoach.com. I have a YouTube channel. My Instagram is probably my favorite place to post a lot of those resources. And in my LinkedIn bio in Instagram, my YouTube channel is there for easy access. And there's a food and flow playlist on my YouTube channel. There's a business playlist on the channel. So you can really get lost down the rabbit hole for a while and learn a ton between the YouTube channel and my Instagram and my website. Brilliant. And that's, that's so generous, like a whole lot of generous information that you can mm -hmm. get without spending a cent. So yep. that's, that's awesome. And if you want, you know, obviously some of that more specific and personal, yep. unique stuff, you can get in touch with Stasha. Absolutely. So with the Instagram account, what's the name of it? Uh, slash Sasha Washburn. Easy. Yeah, but that's just my name. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'll put all of that on on the show notes as well anyway. But, yeah, yeah. we'll give you the link to my free mandala for charting so you can track your period and color at the same time. Brilliant. And we didn't have time to really get into no, that as well. See. But, yeah, <laughs> but there is. I know that with your with your tracking, yeah. um, it is a little bit different than, say, some of the – a lot of a lot of girls now are glued to their phone and a lot of women as yeah. well, so they use the online trackers. Yeah. Um, I don't – I'm sure you've got a whole lot of opinion about that, but I'm sure you've also got it written down, the differences. If yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just the fact that something is telling you what to do instead of you learning it for yourself. Yeah. And I've also known a lot of women that have lost all of their data. So 
Yeah. You know, paper, pen and paper wins in the end yeah. every time. And, and it's also just quite meditative as well is. to do it that way. So it really it allows is. for that space of reflection and self-awareness and coming back to yourself when you're you doing it. You remember it. You retain the information. So when someone says, when did you get your period last? You have to check your app. But when you're charting, you're like, oh, it was about 15 days ago. Yeah. Like you, it's just, it's there. You, mm. It's in your bones. It's in your blood. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. And, you know, and charting isn't for everyone, but it is an option that you can do. And especially if you do go through signs and symptoms and you're oh, really looking at... I think charting should be for everyone, men and children included. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But um, if you're like me, you find those sort of routine things quite hard to get into the pattern of. But, um, but yes, I do hear you and I do see the massive amount of benefit, especially yeah. also if you... You know, you're trying to run a business as well because yeah. it really does take a lot of that pressure off at some points mm-hmm. when you're feeling like crap and you go, oh, my God, I'm just being, you, you know, the inner critic comes out yeah. and you just, like, bash yourself yep. almost. That mean girl in your head just tells you how crap you are because you're being so unproductive today. Totally. But, um, you know, yeah. sometimes it's good to have that that good rationale behind it. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Um I think this was a really interesting conversation. We've covered quite a lot from the awareness to some tips to some understanding and some education. Obviously, there's a whole lot more we can talk about. But um, as I said, you can have a look at Stasha's website and her YouTube channel and her Instagram and all the other social media areas. You can get involved in her programs and learn a hell of a lot more. So I'm Lisa Entwistle. I'm an integrated life clarity and wellbeing coach a workplace wellbeing consultant, event facilitator, and host. And if you want to find out a little bit more about my services or any upcoming events, you can visit my website at www.wealthyliving.com.au. That's W-E-L-L-T-H-Y living.com.au. Or you can connect with me on any of my social media channels. If you have enjoyed this episode, I'd love you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes so that it can reach more people. And um, and then also you can find out a little bit more um, about other people's episodes as well by doing that. So thank you again, Stasha. Thank you for having me. And until next time, I want you all to remember Stasha's favorite quote by Maya Angelou. And that is, I am grateful to be a woman. I must have done something great in another life. Thank you.